Thank you very much and good evening to everyone. Sorry that I can't be there in person in, in Monroe. I, I've got to tell you by way of introduction that uh, I have at least a couple of peripheral uh, connections to Southeast Michigan. Uh, about a century ago, my great grandfather, who was a Methodist minister, had a church in Detroit. And of course, then also a lot closer to the present, as uh, JJ mentioned, uh, I wrote the book 1812, The War That Forged a Nation, and of course dealt with uh, the siege of Detroit, the River Raisin right there uh, in, in, in your neighborhood. But tonight we're going to talk about Pearl Harbor. We're going to talk about World War II. And as JJ mentioned on Monday, it will be December 7th, uh, the 79th anniversary of the Japanese attack on the American fleet at Pearl Harbor. Um, let me suggest to you that this really remains one of the most traumatic events in American history. Uh, those of, of my generation uh, heard grandparents and parents talk about that date. I, of course, like many of you, uh, know where I was on the day in 1963 when President Kennedy was assassinated, we, we all remember uh, where we were on 9-11. It's one of those kind of days. And I think that the um, number of veterans, of course, is dwindling. Uh, those who were actually there were losing more and more of them every day. But that event really remains uh, a traumatic cornerstone, if, if you will, in American history. And I've, I've got to be um, candid and say, you know, when I was researching the admirals, JJ mentioned that book, the admirals, uh, uh, Nimitz, Halsey, Leahy, and King, and I was at Pearl Harbor and sat out there on the uh, battleship Missouri. Missouri, and I'll show you a photo of this later, looks right over the Arizona Memorial. And I really did not no, I had a vague recollection that there were 38 sets of brothers who had been on the Arizona, but I didn't really know much more than that. 38 sets, and there are actually two trios of brothers, so that all told, there are 78 men who are bonded together by blood who are on that ship uh, on that particular Sunday morning in, in 1941. Um, you know, a little bit about some of my other books and how this relates to it. You know, I've, I've got to say that I've, I've usually written about big picture topics. Um, an expansionist president, James K. Polk, uh, MacArthur, in terms of, of, a, of a general who, who certainly had a, a fair amount of ego. And, and in the admirals, the four men who were the only four men in American history to get the five-star rank of fleet admiral. And I was always writing about big picture things and their strategy and how they interreacted. But this book was much different. It was really writing about individual people, just common folks. And we're gonna talk a lot about the folks that who are on the Arizona are really coming out of middle America in the depression. These are the 1930s and it's really tough to put uh, food on the table. And a lot of these men join up, join the Navy, because they're looking for jobs. Uh, and it's not very much money in those days. $36 a month is what new recruits are, are usually getting once they're posted out to the fleet. And all of these men, almost without exception, who are posted to the battleship Arizona and, and throughout the fleet, are sending $5 a month or $10 a month home to their families in order to put food on the table for, for younger siblings. And, you know, I, I've got to say that, that a lot of times, maybe all the time, these men really, instead of worrying about the strategy and the big picture things of which I've usually written, you know, frequently, you know, their, their things were very personal. Their goals were really more to just live to see another sunrise. And I, I think the, the other thing in terms of this particular book, Brothers Down, 
that's different from other things that, that I've done is that the research path, we, Andy and I were talking a little bit about the archives there at, at the museum beforehand. And the research path for this, uh, much different than what I've done. I've done research everywhere from the Library of Congress to the uh, uh, Washington Navy Yard and on for some of my books. But this research really took me to individual families. Sometimes they were pretty easy to track down and sometimes they were, were relatively difficult. In fact, you know, I got to the point after perhaps a second or third letter uh, with no response, uh, you know, I would, there were a couple people who just didn't want to talk for a variety of reasons, but I would just say, you know, if I've really connected with you and you don't want to be interviewed for this book, fine, but please tell me so, so I know. And of course, with 78 men, 38 sets of brothers, there was no way I could tell the story of everyone but I, I did want to focus on perhaps about eight or 10 families in depth. And I'm going to share photos with you in a second in terms of, of some of those. So in taking that research path with those individual families, I think two things really stood out. One was those who were interested and the vast majority were in supporting my, my work and having their relative stories told it was their willingness, their willingness to go through family photos, diaries, put me in touch with other relatives, and, and really um, almost lay everything out on the table, sometimes very private stories. And the second thing that I was really struck with in terms of the research path was that not only their willingness to share those stories, but there's still today not only a great personal pride for their relatives. I think that's probably quite understandable. But there's also a, a lingering sadness that these folks in, the, in their families were lost. And you know, these sometimes were really either grandchildren or uh, nieces or uncles, uh, a second or third generation removed. So it was, it was a much more emotional experience for me than, than what I would, would normally write about. Um, I, get, I guess two other broad comments before we get to the slides. One is about this whole concept of brothers serving together. Now, I, I would imagine that many of you know about the Sullivan brothers. That's probably the most famous family of, of brothers from World War II. The Sullivans, out of the five brothers who joined up, two had actually been in the Navy previously and done their stint, gone back home to Iowa, and they were friends with the Ball brothers, Bill and Maston Ball. And those two Ball brothers ended up on the Arizona serving together. So when the Arizona was attacked and both of the Ball brothers killed, the Sullivan brothers, their friends in Iowa, joined up to avenge their deaths. And that's how the five Sullivan brothers who said to the recruiter, look, you know, we're willing to enlist, but you got to keep us all together. And the Navy did that. And the Sullivans ended up on the cruiser Juno. Rather tragically, the, the Juno was one of the ships that went down in those horrendous fights around Guadalcanal uh, late in 1942, almost roughly a year af after Pearl Harbor. And all of the five Sullivan brothers, again, who had joined up to avenge brothers from the Arizona, uh, perished. So I think that that's the Sullivan story that the general public knows. I don't think the general public knows, again, that there were 78 brothers on the USS Arizona. And, you know, that sort of begs the question, well, why? How could there be uh, these, these 38 families? Well, you know, again, it's the Depression. Older brothers went and joined up in order to get a steady paycheck. When they came home in uniform, to pretty much poverty-stricken areas in, in the United States, um, what better recruiting poster than this older brother in, in uniform? So a lot of younger brothers joined up exactly for that reason. Again, a, a steady income, 
you know, a few of them wanted to get out of the, the local burbs and, and see the world. Sure, there was a little bit of rover uh, instinct in some of them, but most of them really just signed up because they needed a, a steady job. And everyone in those pre-war uh, days prior to 1941 really thought that things were, uh, were, were pretty safe in terms of brothers serving together on, on battleships. I guess the other thing that, that I would say big picture in, in terms of, of brothers and the men who, who were there, I think that I was surprised as much as I've written about World War II. And, you know, we talk about this, this great surprise attack on, on Pearl Harbor. And do, do remember that Japan has really been at war in the Pacific uh, with China since 1937. So the United States has focused on uh, the Pacific and knows that there's some threats being made into Indochina uh, against American territory at that point in, in the Philippines. But I was not prepared for the level of premonition, if you will, that so many of these rank and file brothers had about a looming war coming their way from letters that they wrote home. Let me just, let me just read you what Edward Height said. I'm gonna show you Ed's picture a little bit later, but he wrote to his girlfriend Donna, when I get my next leave and we're back together, Bud had written Donna, let's not waste a minute of it because it may be the last time we get together. Now, maybe you shouldn't have said that, Bud continued, but you know as well as I do that we may be at war any day now. It will be hard for those we love and those that love us. All my love, Bud. So that's about as, as poignant a comment in terms of the premonition that something is going to happen somewhere that one can have. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen and we're gonna hope this all works. And I am going to show some slides. There we go. Um, brothers Down is the book. That's the Arizona. You know, we talk about all these brothers, but in, in some respects, um, if there's one principal character in this book, it's probably the battleship Arizona. I mean, this is something that in the early part of the 20th century, so much of American naval might is built around the battleship. There are people talking about submarines, there are people talking about um, uh, aircraft carriers, but the battleship pre-Pearl Harbor is still the backbone. So let's take a look. There's the Arizona off, off Diamond Head. The Arizona built in 1915, uh, 608 feet in length. It's got four turrets of three 14 inch guns each. Initially, there's a crew of about a thousand, but by the time of Pearl Harbor, there are actually 1500 uh, plus men assigned to the ship. Well, this is the Becker family of uh, Kansas. Uh, five brothers and two sisters. Walter, the second from the right there, is actually the oldest, and he's the one who's sort of in line to pick up the family farm. So when Harvey gets of age, and again, dollars are really tight, Harvey joins the Navy, followed then by brother Marvin, and over here, Wesley. Wesley's kind of an interesting character. In the book, there's a couple of sketches. He's the one that really wanted to be an artist. Uh, he really wanted to go to Kansas State as well to, to go to college and, and do things like that, far rather than, than serving uh, in, in the Navy. But again, he did it for a steady job. He did it because of some comfort in the fact that uh, his uh, uh, older brothers, uh, Marvin and, and Harvey, were there. Now look in the lower right-hand corner. This is uh, Bobby. Bobby's too young to serve immediately in World War II. But it should be no surprise that when, unfortunately, Wesley and Marvin die in the attack on the Arizona, that Bobby's goal, something he just says he has to do, is to sign up and, and join uh, the Navy. 
Well, here are the brothers, again, uh, Wesley, Harvey, and Marvin, at Pearl Harbor, November 1941. Harvey was married at this point, and one of the advantages of that is that you got to spend more time ashore. His wife, Marie, was in Honolulu, and uh, for certain liberty, uh, he was able to do overnights in Honolulu, and, and frequently his brothers could get a, um, liberty and get off the ship and be able to get a, a home-cooked meal. So this is just after Thanksgiving of, of 1941. The Arizona's been at sea on some training exercises. It comes into port. Uh, the Beckers take uh, this, this photograph. And Harvey, as it turns out, of, of the, the 78 brothers, only 15 survive an 80% casualty rate. But Many of them survive because even though they are assigned to the ship on that Saturday night, by whatever luck of the draw, uh, they have uh, either duty or in Harvey's case, uh, uh, liberty to, to spend a, a couple of nights with, with his wife in, in Honolulu. So when the bombs start to fall the next morning, Harvey is ashore and Harvey survives with a tremendous amount of survivor's guilt because Wesley and, and Marvin perish. Well, another family in, in the dirt poor Red Hills of Alabama, the Murdoch family. And there's Charles and Mary, uh, the parents. And again, we've got uh, three brothers that are gonna come out of this family, Charles Wesley, Thomas, and Charles Luther, who all sign up and uh, join the Navy. In this particular case, it's again the oldest brother, Thomas, who is a survivor, but the younger two brothers uh, perish in this. Now I want you to keep your eye on um, uh, Melvin, who is on his dad's lap. And look at Melvin then. Here's what Melvin becomes. Pretty cool in terms of uh, not only his pose, I love the shoes. This is a photo that he sent home in the lower right hand corner. There's Love Melvin, and he's standing next to a 1940 Chevrolet Coupe, probably in the summer of 1941 in Long Beach when the Arizona was there on extended leave. And Melvin uh, buys this car, kind of an interesting family story. And again, some of these family stories get passed down. You have to kind of scratch your head a little bit and, and make sure uh, that they're true. In this particular case, the family story that no one has ever been able to document is that when Melvin sailed off late in July of 1941 on the Arizona, this car was put in storage. And at least from the family's perspective, it was never recovered. It was, it was never found. So what, what happened to it in, in a warehouse in, in Long Beach, uh, uh, no one knows for sure. Well, let's give you just a little bit of a background in terms of what's going on with the attack itself. These ships along Battleship Row, there are nine battleships assigned to the Pacific Fleet. One, the Colorado, named after my home state, is undergoing repairs in Bremerton, Washington. So there are eight ships that are actually uh, in Pearl Harbor that day. This is Fort Island, Battleship Row. There are, are um, seven battleships along here. The eighth battleship is the Pennsylvania, which is in dry dock. And it is actually the uh, flagship of the, of the Pacific Fleet. Well, in the initial attack, there are dive bombers that come in and attack Hickam Field and start to attack some of the surrounding airfields. But then the torpedo wave hits and it's launched by 16 Kate torpedo bombers that are coming in from the Northwest and 24 Kates that are, are coming in from the Southeast. And interestingly enough, despite the Japanese intelligence, these Kates really mistook some of these ships uh, as larger battleships. Now the Utah was initially a battleship, but by this time it's been uh, converted to a target ship. So it's really, even though torpedoes there you can see are launched against the Utah, it's really not um, uh, a, a major capital ship at, at that point. 
The others are, and all of these Kates go and launch torpedoes against the battleships. And note in particular that they're kind of, they're moored in, in pairs, at least a couple of them. So to the torpedo attacks, Oklahoma and West Virginia that are outbound are gonna take a lot more hits. And what you see now is kind of looking back, here are again those dots with Oklahoma outbound, West Virginia outbound, and the Cates are coming in from the Southeast across the interlock and launching torpedoes against those battleships. The Arizona, by the way, is anchored here with Nevada behind it. So we kind of flip over and look at this view from the other side. Again, Oklahoma, and that's the battleship that, that uh, infamously, let's say, uh, ends up rolling. And there's still a number of, of men who are entombed in it. And uh, this is the West Virginia. It's kind of hard to see, but look at the oil slick and the fact that its, uh, its main towers and everything are starting to tilt out. It would have rolled as well, but for the executive officer that immediately ordered some counter flooding measures. So West Virginia ends up kind of settling into the mud. Here's the Arizona. What's the ship outbound? It's the Vestal. The Vestal is a repair ship, and Arizona had a lot of things that were going to be done, including a, a new radar mount and some other uh, carpentry work. Repair ships like the Vestal were kind of the, um, well, think of them as the Home Depot or the ace of the Pacific Fleet, okay? Not only did they have everything that you might need to repair a ship, but they came to you um, and, and made the call. This is the, the Nevada behind and Nevada is the only ship that day to actually get the only capital ship, battleship, to get underway that particular day uh, and, and steam. Okay, let's talk about the Shy brothers. You know, it's interesting, um, Malcolm, who's the sailor in the upper left there, and his brother Gordon, who's the Marine, in the lower right. And yes, those of you who are Marine veterans, um, uh, there's a contingent of Marines on, on board the battleship. That's what they routinely did with capital ships like aircraft carriers and battleships. And it was a situation where the Marine detachment basically performed guard duty. Uh, they ran errands for the commanding officer. Obviously, if they got into a fight, which is going to happen on, on Sunday morning, December 7th, Marines uh, manned the anti-aircraft guns. The gentleman on the upper right is Ed uh, Brom, who is just a friend of the Shy brothers. This guy, though, in the lower left is Weston, and he spelled his name W-E-S-S, -S, went by Wes. And Wes Balfour is, in fact, a close friend of the Shy brothers from Laguna Beach. By no small coincidence, uh, Wes's sister, Marge, is uh, a girlfriend of Gordon. And, you know, those of us who remember in the days when you would write letters and you'd have to wait days to hit, get some kind of response from um, a girlfriend or sweetheart can probably relate to the fact that Gordon was a little upset. Wes shows up in Pearl Harbor. He's clearly got some uh, and, and by the way, he's in, in the, in the um, Army Air Corps. He's going to end up in the Philippines. But he shows up in Pearl Harbor. They have a reunion to, with the Shy brothers. And he probably brings some intelligence from the home front that basically says to Gordon, well, you know, maybe Marge has been dating somebody else. What's going on? So let me just read you what Gordon's letter uh, to Marge has to say. Gordon writes, Marge. What's the matter? Am I poison? Gordon had asked Marge at the start of a letter written on November 2nd, 1941. Then he got to the heart of the matter. I have heard that you and Harry had ideas of getting hitched. Well, if you do, I hope that you will be happy. Those magnanimous words aside, Gordon crossed out a couple of words and then added, no, that isn't cursing, but just a misprint. Well, <laughs> Marge's response um, must have um, been lost. We don't know what she wrote, but it definitely set Gordon straight. 
doggone was I glad to hear from you, Gordon wrote back. I thought that you were on the outs, but I see that I was badly mistaken. Calling himself a dope for doubting and promising not to get, quote, any more of those silly ideas, Gordon confessed that this was the second letter he had written to her in response, but that he couldn't bring himself to mail it. He wanted to give it to Marge in person. So we'll keep it, he wrote, till I see you again, if nothing doesn't happen. But if something should happen, and you will get it in the mail, it will be dated November 20, 1941. Well, story, of course, is that the, netter, the letter never arrived. Uh, Malcolm Shive here was in the bowels of the Arizona when, when the bombs hit. Gordon, as a Marine, was up on deck um, manning 50 caliber machine guns. Gordon's body was one of the few that was actually recovered. Uh, Malcolm's never was. And with Gordon dead, you know, six months later, the end of the story is that Marge did indeed marry Harry that, uh, that Gordon was, was concerned about. Now, this photo, what could happen is that you would go into Honolulu and with your buddies, you'd have a, a photo taken and it would be printed out for you on the front side of a postcard. So the back side of this particular postcard is this, that uh, was, was sent uh, home to Gordon's mom. And look, it says, look who is all here. And of course he means Wes, who's, who's in Honolulu on his way en route to the Philippines. How's that for a reunion out here? Wes has left for, See that squiggly line? Can't say where, or the censor wouldn't pass the, the postcard. Uh, of course, today we know he was headed for the Philippines, but he couldn't, couldn't say that. So I don't know when I will be able to see him again, letter following Gordon. And of course, um, so many folks, uh, the Westgates in this particular, uh, Lois had a different last name because she had remarried. But um, in this particular case, there, there were so many packages that were returned um, because they just were undeliverable. So many family members went ahead and immediately after December 7th, you know, sent letters, tried to get in touch, and, and rather, rather tragically and heartbreakingly, so many of, of those attempts at, at, at correspondence were, um, were returned. Well, I, I have to tell you that there was also a father and son on the Arizona. They don't figure into my 78 count, but um, they were, were both there serving together. Great story in terms of they both thought it was wonderful to be together. Thomas Augusta, and he went by the nickname of, of Gussie, Free, was an old salt who had served in World War I, kind of gotten out of the Navy, and, and then really found that maybe it was the place for him to be. Uh, he and William's mother had gotten a divorce. Uh, Gussie spent a lot of time as an absentee parent. Uh, at one point, then, William went and, and lived with his sister and basically was raised by her in Texas. So Gussie would, would see William when they'd come home, when he would come home on leave. And when William turned 17, what was the first thing he wanted to do? Well, he wanted to, to serve in the Navy. Uh, if you were 17 in those days, you had to get parental permission to go ahead and, and sign up. Gussie gave it. William went to boot camp, and they both end up on, on the Arizona together. Now, on the night of December 6, 1941, Gussie was not feeling well. So he was confined to sick bay, which was in the forward part of the ship. William had some oh, kind of shirt tail cousin relatives that he had dinner with in Honolulu. In fact, it's that branch of the family that kind of got me this particular information on, on, the, on the freeze. And, um, you know, they said, well, you know, why don't you, why don't you just stay and, and spend the night? Uh, you've got liberty, you could go, go back to the ship Sunday morning. But William was concerned about his dad. His dad was in sick bay, and he, he said, no, I'm going to go back to the ship, and uh, I'm going to check on dad. Well, he did. He was on the ship, and of course, both father and son 
end up perishing uh, in the attack on, on, on Sunday morning. Now, Buddy Christensen was a lot luckier. Buddy is actually the last brother, the 38th set, if you will, to show up on the Arizona. His older brother, uh, Edward, went by nickname of Sonny, had joined up, and Sonny, by the way, was a baker, made great, great pies and things, and would sneak some to, to younger brother, uh, Buddy, from time to time. But, but Buddy ends up reporting to the Arizona in mid-October of 1941. Again, he's the last of the, the sets of brothers who are going to be on board or assigned to the Arizona on December 7th. And on the morning of December 7th, just about 7.30, because the Arizona's been at sea, Buddy and Sonny have not had occasion to have liberty together. And what they want to do is go into Honolulu, both dressed in their whites, get a photograph taken of both of them to send back home to mom in Kansas as a Christmas present. Well, they're standing there about 7.40, 7.45, uh, th th what you have to do, you have to wait for the flag raising ceremony at eight o'clock, and then you can begin to um, take the launch into, into, if you have liberty that day, in, into uh, Honolulu. So Buddy and Sonny are there, and, and Buddy, and probably with what I imagine to be kind of a younger brother smirk, notices that Sonny's uh, white cap has got a black smudge on it. Well, clearly that's not going to do either for their photograph, or it's probably not going to mass uh, pass muster with the officer of the deck uh, in terms of asking permission to go ashore. So Sonny says to Buddy on deck, wait here while he goes below to get another cap. Well, of course, Buddy never saw Sonny again because within minutes, the planes come over, the attack starts, Buddy runs to his duty station and Sonny is, is trapped in, in the bowels of the ship. Carl Buddy Christensen does in fact survive. He comes home, raises a family, great story of uh, working as a chief of police in a, in a town in, in southeastern Kansas. Um, I talked to his son. His son was, uh, was very proud of his dad and, and very glad, uh, even though Buddy has since, since passed on, to tell, to tell his particular story. Well, let's take a look at how those bombs are, are actually going to fall now. Because remember, we've been talking about torpedoes. And the torpedoes with these big oil slicks that have come in from, oh, excuse me there. Um, I'm not sure what happened, but we'll get back, just one second. The, um, the torpedoes that have come in and made these oil slicks from the Oklahoma and the West Virginia have pretty well left the inboard battleships uh, unscathed. Here's Arizona. Now, see these puffs? This is the stern of the ship. Uh, the entrance to Pearl Harbor is to the right of this photograph. So all of the battleships are moored with their bows toward the sea to facilitate a quick departure. Of course, quick is a relative term in terms of getting steam up and really being in a position to uh, deploy to sea when there's aircraft overhead. But these uh, puffs from the stern of the Arizona are from the initial bombs that then the second wave of high altitude bombers, as opposed to the torpedo bombers, begin to fly up battleship row and drop bombs. So Arizona takes some hits. The vestal next to it is, in fact, the repair ship uh, that's, that's moored there. What happens next is that there are bombs that fall around the bow. And these are armor-piercing shells. They're basically 16-inch naval ordnance that drop through the five-inch deck platings and end up, in the case of the Arizona, exploding and basically creating a horrendous explosion. And the two men, two brothers, who are kind of part of this story, one of them, Joe, on the left, is on the Arizona as this explosion occurs. The other one, uh, I'm sorry, I've, I've got that confused. Joe is on the Vestal. Joe is on the Vestal. Mike, to the right here, is um, 
on the Arizona. And when that explosion hits, it just literally lifts the Arizona up out of the water. And one observer who's on board says, you know, that's when the ship just rose up and, and kind of shook like a dog. So imagine, if you will, and I'm, I'm going to show you the explosion picture next, but these two brothers, I mean, here they are having a drink together. And Joe had, by the way, been on the Arizona, but he's on, on the, uh, the Vestal and Mike. Uh, quite a story of the two Giovanazzos and the Navy reporting at one point, well, one's okay, one's missing. Oh no, he's okay too. And of course, the tragedy is that at the end of it is that Joe does survive. Uh, I've talked to his son uh, who lives out in, in San Diego and Mike, uh, despite the fact that he was going to be going home on leave and like so many of these guys probably was going home to maybe pop a question, a uh, proposal of marriage to a, to a girlfriend. But uh, this horrendous explosion, you can see basically there's the Arizona in the midst of it. This is Nevada, which has taken some hits. But uh, this huge explosion covering up Arizona and forward of, of Arizona are the, um, the, the West Virginia and the Tennessee. Well, I mentioned um, the, the fact of, of Donna and, and Bud Height. I, I, I told you that story and, and read those lines. You know, Bud's brother Wesley was, was on the ship as well. And he had written home to his mom that, you know, I don't know why are you worried about us out here? You know, we're just fine. I mean, I'm with Bud. Um, we're doing great. And one of his lines was, quote, I'm safer on this battle boat than I would be driving back and forth to work. Well, tragically, of course, that didn't happen. Uh, but in his particular case, his younger brother, Wesley was the younger brother. He'd recently been, been promoted uh, above his brother, Bud. But Bud didn't seem to care too much because he was busy writing letters home to Donna. And basically, uh, no one has ever known absolutely, but the family story is that everyone was pretty sure that somewhere in Bud's gear on the Arizona was an engagement ring for Donna and that uh, he was going to give it to her the next time he was home. I got to talk to, and it took me a while to track her down, but I got to talk to uh, Donna's daughter. Um, and, you know, and she was pretty candid and forthcoming about, yes, you know, her mom went on and, of course, married the man who, who was the daughter's father. Um, but, you know, there was something that one love of her life had always been Bud, and she was never quite the same after that. Well, this is, this is the whole superstructure on the Arizona those are the fire hoses coming off the Tennessee that's forward of the bow. But you can, you can just see that there's basically nothing left of the forward part of the ship. And the explosion had lifted the decks up, lifted the entire ship out of the water, like that one person uh, said in terms of describing it. And then as it came back down, the decks simply pancaked, boom, 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 on top of, of one another. If you survive, and were on the ship and survived, you were probably aft in either the number three or the number four turret. The number one and number two turret at the bow is right here. And again, there's, it's tragedy in all of the story, but Gussie Free in sickbay would have been just about here underneath, um, underneath uh, the first and second turret. Well, the other thing that I tried to write some about is that there's a lot of emotion on this particular day with uh, brothers, uh, particularly those who have been uh, in, in Honolulu, uh, trying to get out to the ship. There's a story of so many people in Honolulu 
trying to get back to their ships and, and the boats, the, the little whale boats that would come and cruise back and forth across the harbor to be able to, to take crew back and forth. You know, they'd call out the name of the ship, um, West Virginia, Oklahoma, uh, and they, they'd take people aboard and go. But as one observer said, it was very, very quiet because the name Arizona was not called out. I mean, the ship had just been decimated. One of the survivors, and there are only two survivors from the Arizona left today, they weren't brothers, all of the brothers have passed on some years ago who survived. But one of the, one of the survivors today had in fact been the coxswain of, of, a, ship, of a little boat uh, basically coming back across the harbor and he basically saw the Arizona blow up in front of him in his, in his face. And he went about the, the harbor then pulling men out of the water. Some, including members of the Marine contingent on the Arizona, end up swimming towards shore. Because as, as you saw from some of the photographs, uh, the ships are moored not too far from Fort Island. But of course, the problem is that there's all kinds of oil in the water, the oil's um, aflame. The Japanese Zeros, the fighters that have been supporting uh, the, the bombers, come in and strafe the ship, strafe survivors. And it's, it's just, it's a very, very hellish and difficult situation. There's also the anxiety because we have, we have the first attack, which creates all this damage. We have very quickly thereafter a second attack that is not torpedoes uh, at that point. The Japanese thought that after the first attack, the surprise would be over and the lumbering torpedo bombers would be sitting ducks. So the second wave just includes zeros and um, dive bombers. But that occurs, and then everybody is sort of looking over his shoulder saying, oh, you know, are, are we in for another attack? Uh, are the Japanese coming back a, a third time? And I think the, the thing that maybe is important about that is that on a personal level, everyone is just really concerned about that. There's, there's indeed some shell shock, and they're going about their jobs. But it's, it's, it's really a nerve wracking situation through the afternoon of December 7th. Now, Chester W. Nimitz, when he finally shows up in Pearl Harbor, um, and he, his, his job, by the way, he's a Rear Admiral in Washington, D.C. on December 7th. He's in charge of the Bureau of Navigation, which is essentially the Navy's personnel office. So many of these men out at Pearl Harbor, he's sent there. Uh, he knows their records well. And it's Admiral Ernest J. King and Franklin Roosevelt who basically say to Nimitz uh, right after Pearl Harbor, you get out there and stay there until the war is won. Nimitz shows up on Christmas Eve of 1941 in Pearl Harbor, flies in a big four engine Coronado flying boat, lands in the harbor, gets into a whale boat to go ashore and basically realizes that in his white uniform, he doesn't dare sit down because still weeks after this ship and everything in the harbor is basically covered with grime and grit and oil and everything else. And Nimitz is, is, is pretty overwhelmed with, with the task, but he does recognize three things that I, that I think is, are, are important to taking this tragedy of Pearl Harbor and making a winning strategy uh, in World War II in the Pacific. And the first, of course, is that there are no aircraft carriers present in uh, Pearl Harbor. There are three aircraft carriers assigned to the Pacific Fleet at this particular time. Two of them have been in, in Pearl Harbor, but the Enterprise has been sent to deliver Marine planes to the uh, Marine garrison on Wake. Uh, Bill Halsey's in charge of that. The Lexington has deployed uh, a few days earlier uh, on December 5th. It's going to take and try to get to Midway. It doesn't end up uh, reaching its destination, it's recalled, but it's at sea as well. Third carrier is the Saratoga, and it's on the West Coast being outfitted with planes in, in San Diego. 
So we save the carriers. Uh, they, they become critically important, especially in the first six months of 1942. Second thing is that, is that Nimitz is an old uh, submariner and he's cut his teeth in submarines. He recognizes that the sub force is basically unscathed. Now, the US submarine fleet is gonna have some problems uh, in terms of faulty torpedoes early in the, early in the war, but the subforce is, is a, 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 a strong uh, initial attack force against the Japanese after Pearl Harbor. Third thing, of course, is that in terms of the Japanese not coming back for a third strike, Nimitz realizes that the oil storage facilities, the dry dock facilities, all of those things have basically been left unscathed. So imagine if you will, fast forward, those of you who are historians of war in the Pacific, you know what's gonna happen with the Battle of Midway in, in six months. And that if, if Nimitz hadn't been able to turn around the carrier Yorktown in the dry dock facilities at Pearl Harbor, if all of those oil storage tanks had gone up in flame and the pipeline between the West Coast and Hawaii had to be shuttling fuel, then it really would have been a pretty tenuous situation to, to hold on to, to Pearl Harbor. Well, I mentioned being out there for, for research. The Arizona, of course, lies there under the Arizona Memorial. This photo was taken from the bridge of the Missouri. The Missouri is one of the four um, uh, Iowa-class battleships launched very late in the war. And of course, it's the battleship that is gonna receive the Japanese surrender on September 2nd of, of 1945. You know, I, I've gotta tell you that this is a very emotional place. I imagine some of you have been there. You take the, the crew boat out from the National Park uh, Service facility to the memorial here. And, and yet, you know, there, there are a lot of folks, there's a lot of things going on in, in the harbor. To me, even the more emotional place than this is in fact, and of course I, I should say before I move on, that the names of all of those who have died, um, 1,077 uh, casualties that day, are engraved on the wall and a number of survivors have chosen to have their ashes entombed in the wreckage along with in some cases their brothers and in other cases just just their shipmates but as as um, holy and sacred of ground as this Arizona memorial is I found that the National Memorial Cemetery of the Pacific, which is in the punch bowl above Honolulu, is even more um, of, of a, a place that just sends shivers up and down one's spine. You can walk through these memorials here, which are called the Courts of Honor, and all of the casualties from the entire um, Pacific War, unless they happen to be buried in other cemeteries or memor mem memorialized in other, other cemeteries throughout the Pacific, like in the Philippines, uh, those names are in fact etched there and one simply walks through and again sees all these names that are the same. And they're the three Murdoch brothers. They're the three Becker brothers, um, quite emotional. And above uh, all of this, the quote that's uh, put, the solemn pride that must be yours, uh, it goes on to say, to have laid such a sacrifice upon the altar of freedom. Those words are, are actually from a letter that Abraham Lincoln wrote toward the end of the Civil War, uh, a letter of condolence to a mother who, just like we're talking about here, had lost multiple sons uh, in, in the conflict. I should mention, um, there were two Michigan brothers, I didn't come across, never made family connections with them, but Anthony and Stanley Zarnecki uh, were in fact uh, on the ship together. Anthony, Tony survived. His ashes he wanted to have put with his brother, uh, whose body was never recovered, Stanley, uh, who is entombed uh, still in, in the Arizona. 
And you know, the Zarnecki family, like so many others, uh, paid the sacrifice multiple times because a younger brother, who again wanted to join up to avenge older brother's deaths, younger brother ended up in the infantry, lost his life in, his name was Henry, lost his life in Italy uh, during that particular campaign. All right, I'm gonna stop screen sharing and basically say to Heather, um, I'd be glad, I can certainly tell a couple more stories or uh, we could go and take uh, some questions if you have hands raised, whatever, whatever you wish to do. Well, that's a great um, suggestion. If anyone has a question, um, feel free to raise, raise your hand as Stephen just did. And, uh, and I'll, I will unmute you. So Stephen? All right, can you hear me? I can, hi Stephen. Hey, uh, evening, thank you for your time tonight. Sure. Uh, no, what got my interest is, uh, thank you to Monroe uh, Museum for posting this in the newspaper. My wife caught it yesterday in the Monroe uh, newspaper. And me being a history buff, I appreciate, again, your time. But my mother's cousin, uh, Raymond Powalski, he was from Buffalo, New York. He was on the Arizona that morning. And what I find interesting in uh, your uh, lecture this evening is that you had mentioned uh, the letters home and how some of the sailors had premonitions something was going to happen. And I wanted to share that Raymond sent a letter home that arrived after the attack to Uncle Bob and Aunt Agnes in Buffalo. It arrived shortly before Christmas and uh, Raymond's letter said, uh, Dad I'm, and Uncle Bob, his father was also in the Navy in World War I. He says, Dad, I'm not quite sure what's going on here at Pearl but it's eerily quiet, almost as if the, a calm before the storm, like it is back home on Lake Erie. So again, you know, it kind of struck a, struck a chord that, you know, it wasn't just Raymond who had uh, had that feeling, but there was other sailors that were there, uh, you know, at Pearl that felt the same, right? So I just wanted to share that with you. Well, thanks for doing so and, and cherish those letters and, you know, I, now, now I'm sounding like the historian archivist, but I've, I have helped so many uh, of these families sort of think that even if they want to preserve the original, you know, get some copies into uh, some great uh, World War II museums. Certainly there's one in New Orleans, there's one in Fredericksburg uh, Museum of, of, of the Pacific that have a growing archive. Um, and and that's that's a, a pretty pretty poignant uh, letter indeed. So yeah, thank thanks Stephen for sharing it very much. And uh, Kara has a question. Hello, can you hear me? I can. Hi, Kara. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for your time. I've learned so much. I've read your 1812 book and it's fantastic. Um, you're welcome. My, I do have a question, like how did you come up with the idea for your book? Like what type of research did you do? How long did it take you? Elementary uh, questions. Sure, that, I mean, but that is a great question. How I come up with topics, you know, sometimes they seem to gel and pretty easily uh, in this particular case, I, I've got to say that it, it was sort of a, uh, a, a situation that we, I came together with my editor, uh, agent. It was sort of a, a collaborative thing. And we we're trying to look for, for stories where historians are usually looking, trying to look for stories that, that uh, no one's written about before. And as I mentioned, I, you know, I had this vague idea and that there have been lots of brothers uh, but I, but I really didn't know that for a fact. And the, the editor and agent said, "Well, why don't you go and do this?" And I said, "Well, okay, but before I really commit, I've got to track down some of these families because this is not going to be easy." And even though one would think 
Uh, I'll just tell you that in, in Colorado here, I thought, okay, the Jones brothers, that they should be pretty easy to find. They live over on the Western Slope. And I, you know, everything from ancestry.com to newspaper archives, things like that, I, I went through. And a number of, of these families, I, I, I simply couldn't find. Um, and I did try, and it was somewhat because of what information was coming to me. Uh, you know, the more information I got, the more likely, like in the cases of, of the Murdochs and, and the Beckers, I was to, to tell their, their story. But it took me about two years to, to really work on this. And the amazing thing, of course, is that um, this is one of those books that just goes on and on in terms of research because it sort of engenders people like Stephen's letter from, from his family uh, of sharing and, and more information. So it's, it's, been, um, it's been a moving experience for me. Wow, thank you so much. That was amazing. And I have, I have your book, The Admirals. I can't, haven't read it yet, but I will. Oh, but well, thank, thanks for having it. I appreciate it, Kira. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, Richard? Yes, Richard Micka. <clears throat> nice to see you folks. Thank you, sir, for the wonderful program. I was three years old <laughs> when December 7 happened. I still remember it. I was in Battle Creek, Michigan, at my aunt's house, and I, I was a fr I'm a friend. I was a friend of a uh, man that served aboard the USS Growler. They took revenge at Midway after uh, after Pearl Harbor, and he told me he said the Growler is still on patrol. Look it up sometime. G R O W L E R. It's a tremendous story. Thank you, sir. Wonderful. Well, thank thank you, Richard. So. Yeah, there's, there's, there's great stories of all of those uh, submarines going out. Again, um, you know, later in the war, they have a lot more impact on Japanese shipping because the, the torpedoes are, are better. But, um, it, you know, there, there, there's some pretty poignant stories of, of that. And, you know, I, I just tell you one other quick submarine story that is kind of a tragic one. What happened to West Balfour? you ask, who was the, the friend of the Shives who was passing through to go out to the Philippines. He ends up loading ordnance for one of MacArthur's um, pursuit squadrons of, of fighter aircraft. Uh, the Japanese overrun the island. He basically uh, ends up retreating to Bataan. He's captured. <clears throat> he uh, then spends three years on Davao in a Japanese prisoner of war camp. And as the Americans close in, the Japanese want to move um, those prisoners for fear of falling into American hands and telling about all the atrocities they've endured for, for those three years. And those prisoners, about 700, are put on a transport ship and are being moved up to Manila. And an American submarine not realizing what is on board as far as prisoners basically um, attacks that ship. And um, the tragedy is that the Japanese guards then basically machine gun the prisoners uh, as they're going into the water. So here's Wes Balfour, you know, one of the, the, the fleet-footed lads of Laguna Beach when, where they all grew up together. The two Shive brothers are dead at Pearl Harbor. And, and Wes, even though he skinny little guy survives three years in a POW camp, um, is someone else who doesn't make it home. Well. Uh, Stanley? Did the Navy ultimately disallow uh, siblings to serve aboard the same ship? That's a great question, and it took a lot of research to try to figure that out, Stanley, um, because everybody assumes, especially, and by everybody, I mean the general public, especially after the Sutherland brothers go down, that the Navy outlawed uh, brothers serving together. In fact, there's sort of something, people talk about the Sullivan Law, where you can't serve together with your brother. That is not fact, that never happened. What the Navy did is by the fall of 1942, 
and even, I, I think it actually took into 43, they basically send out a communique that says, okay, commanding officers are discouraged from allowing brothers to serve together. But never ever does the Navy go and say and take affirmative action and break up uh, brothers. In fact, there are six brothers in the Patton family, and that's P-A-T-T-E-N, uh, who are serving on the Nevada, and they end up together, they survive the Nevada, they end up all together on the aircraft carrier Lexington at Coral Sea. And as you know, Lexington is sunk and goes down um, in a way that most uh, survive, and all of the Patton brothers survive that. So here are our six brothers uh, basically have two ships sunk out from underneath them, but the Navy still does not affirmatively say and absolutely prohibit brothers serving together. Now what the Navy did do it, toward the closing months of the war in 1944 is basically put out a um, sole survivor protocol, think Saving Private Ryan, okay? And at that particular point, um, you could go ahead and apply for stateside or rear echelon duty if you were the sole surviving um, uh, sibling. But you had to take affirmative action to do it. And that late in the war, so many of these brothers, like Bob Becker, um, uh, like uh, the, the Shives' younger brother, uh, have such a strong sense of patriotism and a strong, strong sense of revenge uh, for their brother's deaths that they don't take advantage of that. So the, the short, that's the background, but the short answer to the story, Stanley, or to your question, is that no, the Navy never absolutely prohibits brothers serving together. Well, I had kind of a random question. Um, sure. You mentioned that um, serving um, was important to a lot of um, younger unmarried men because they needed a job. And you mentioned $36 a month. Do you know what the equivalent of that would be today? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I have to do, I have to do the math. I really, I really don't in, in, into the hundreds of dollars, but certainly not in, into the thousands of, of, of dollars. So I should have known the answer to that, Heather. So, <laughs> hey, let me tell you one more story, speaking about numbers of, of brothers. You know, just within a week of when this book came out in uh, May of 2019, you know, I get a call from somebody who lives in my little town. I live in a little town of 5,000 in the Colorado Rockies. And uh, this woman says, well, you wrote about the brothers on the Arizona, but what about the Conan Camp brothers? You know, you didn't tell about the Conan Camp brothers. And, you know, you talk about research. I'm sitting there scratching my head and thinking, well, how could I? I there's 38 sets of brothers. I, I came up with this list from, from National Park Service lists, from Navy lists, from the muster records on, on the ship as of November 30 of, of um, uh 1941, you know, how could I have missed the Conan Camp brothers who were Clarence and Emil from, from Seattle? So I did a little bit more digging. And of course, the Conan Camps were on the ship together and had been through much of 1941. However, um, Emil had actually been transferred off November 15th of 1941, he was en route back to a new duty assignment on the East Coast, and it was his brother Clarence who remained on the Arizona. So there weren't 39 sets of brothers, but there's still this tragic story that um, basically Emil uh, is alive, Clarence is dead aboard the ship, and the Navy's lost track of where Emil is so for a period of time, his parents get missing in action and then killed in action uh, telegrams that both sons have been killed. And of course, it was, it was only Clarence who had, who had remained. So all, all kinds of stories like that. 
my colleague just messaged me, Lisa, thank you. $36 in 1941 is worth $637 today. Ah, good. Isn't much. You, got, you guys are a good research institution. See there? Good job, Andy. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. <laughs> thank oh, you for doing the math. I don't see any hands raised, Heather. I would like to and, uh, ask a question. Um, so for people who might be interested in learning a bit uh, more about uh, Pearl Harbor, do you have any uh, recommended readings uh, for folks? Well, you know, I have to, I have to recommend the admirals, quite frankly. <laughs> Kara, I think it's you who said that you had it. Um, I think in terms, I think in terms of, of the overview, um, that certainly sets the story for, for what's going on. The, the other thing that I would say, if you really want to get in depth, Gordon Prang, and it's P-R-A-N-G-E, um, has done a three volume, he's sort of Mr. Pearl Harbor, and he's done a three volume set that uh, is basically his lifetime's work. Um, so I think that's probably pretty important. I have to look over on my shelf um, and refresh my memory. And I was there, a book by Edward, um, Edward Layton. Layton's the intelligence officer. And I was there is a book that really, if you're interested into the code breaking and what we knew when, um, you know, I, I, I would definitely recommend uh, uh, Layton's book. And I was there as well as uh, Prang's trilogy. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Oh, and we got three hands up. Uh oh. Trying to mute myself so I don't <laughs> make too much noise. Um, Stephen, please ask your question. All right. Can you guys? Can you hear me? We can. All right. So, one of the other stories I remember passed on from my grandmother from that event was that shortly before, I mean, just days prior to December 7th, there was a Japanese ambassador that visited Washington with uh, uh, talks of peace with the Americans. Whatever happened to that ambassador uh, after those talks? Apparently they had failed. Well, they, they, they did fail. And I, I write at some length without getting too complicated that there are ongoing negotiations between Secretary of State Hull and the, uh, there's a Japanese ambassador in place in Washington, plus the envoy that, uh, that you refer to. And they were going back and forth and having some discussions. You know, quite frankly, I, I think at that point, Franklin Roosevelt really is trying to uh, stop war from happening. It's, as, as, as you mentioned, and, and I have too, Stephen, you know, this idea that there's an inevitability of, of what's going to happen, uh, certainly present, because Japan needs natural resources to continue its war machine, continue its fight against China. And in the summer of 1941, the United States, Great Britain, and the Netherlands have basically imposed an oil embargo against Japan. So Japan is trying to look to the Dutch East Indies and figure out um, where they're going to get natural resources, including tin and, and rubber and things like that. So I guess to the point of your question, is that even though the Japanese envoys are kind of going through the process, if you will, um, Japan's really, and by that time, the, la the day they had their last meetings, of course, the Japanese fleets well sailed before that. And there's also this, this famous 16-part uh, communique that is being uh, deciphered and um, translated and typed for presentation to uh, Secretary Hull. And of course, rather famously, uh, it arrives uh, within an hour after the news has reached Washington of, of the attack on, on, on Pearl Harbor. So I, I think that there, there were, from the American side, there's certainly some reasons and some, some effort to, to kind of delay the inevitable. But from the Japanese side, um, I think they're pretty well committed. We could argue, and of course, lots of books have been written on this too, about what the Japanese were really thinking they could get out of this quick attack. 
Their goal, of course, was to uh, destroy the American fleet, blunt America's interests in sailing west, uh, basically to moralize the American public. And Franklin Roosevelt has really been going on kind of, kind of walking a fairly tight rope. In, there's a big isolationist feeling in the United States. And you know he's trying to get America prepared for war. Uh, there are more and more funds being put into to Navy and, and armaments, but there's still a fair amount of isolationism. And I, you know, I've written, and I would just say that the Japanese going on and thinking they could take out America's will to fight in a surprise attack really didn't understand the American psyche. Because in a couple of hours on that quiet Sunday morning, Japan did more to unify the American public um, than anything Franklin Roosevelt or the American Congress or any other force in the United States could have done. Uh, and by that evening, uh, I'm a baseball fan. I, I, one of the things I write uh, in, in the book is, is Bob Feller, Cleveland Indians, okay? I, I know it's down Lake, but uh, you, you know, going and signing up, one of the first major league stars to sign up the next day. And it's that kind of uh, emotion and spirit that um, this surprise attack engenders in the American public. All right, thank you. Uh, Richard? Yeah, <clears throat> Richard Mick and Mr. Barnman, very nice program. Uh, I, I know a fella who is a good friend of mine who finally avenged uh, Pearl Harbor. His name was Paul Tibbetts. You might uh, know the name. Yeah, is he a, is a good friend of yours? Yes. It, it, yes, it, indeed. It, so, and, and go ahead, Richard, and tell everybody then where, where Richard, uh, where uh, Tibbetts is uh, in early August of, of 1945. He's over, <laughs> over here, Oshima, with a B-29 super flying fortress <laughs> dropping an atomic bomb. <laughs> at, at the controls of that B-29, the Enola Gay, um, in, yep. indeed, so. The one. <laughs> He's a nice man. Good, good. Um, whoever signed in as brothers? Uh, I'm not. Hello. Oh, Hello. there you are. Yes, we've got. We've got yeah. you. I, I thought that was the passcode. My name's Brian, not brothers. Um, your story of the uh, zeros, you know, targeting sailors in the water. It reminds me. My grandfather was in the Navy in World War II, and they he would say, whenever they were in the Pacific, they would uh, carry selections of different size corks. They put them in the lifeboats because the Japanese would. Um, machine gun basically the the lifeboats after uh, a ship would be going down um but my question uh is I, i've read or heard that had the japanese been logistically able to do it move to the west coast of the, you know the continental california um, washington that that could have severely changed a lot of the outlook of the war and it would have painted a completely different picture um, what, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, of course, logistically, it would have been almost impossible, but um, in theory, what are your thoughts on that? Well, that, that's a very interesting question. Uh, of course, there is fear uh, up and down the West Coast on the evening of December 7th and continuing that there is going to be some kind of attack, whether it's from aircraft carriers or um, I mean, there are even reports up and down the Pacific coast. There's certainly reports on Oahu in, in the Hawaiian Islands of Japanese troops coming ashore. You know, that, that never happened. Um, I think the, the far more uh, likely scenario is that the Japanese would have gone ahead and invaded the Hawaiian Islands. And I think they certainly had the resources to do that. 
Um, and if in fact they had launched the third attack wave that I alluded to and wiped out the dry docks and wiped out the oil tanks and everything else, then the American fleet, rather than Nimitz flying out to Pearl Harbor and telling everyone, okay, we're all in this together, but we're going to win, you know, he would have been having that conversation in, in, in San Diego or Long Beach or, or someplace else because it would have been very difficult to hold the Hawaiian Islands. Now, your questions kind of presupposes or, or asks a little bit about, uh, you know, Japanese, <coughs> excuse me, Japanese uh, capabilities, Brian. I, the other part of that answer, I think, needs to be, a number of people always have said the Japanese were going to invade Australia. Well, the Japanese really never had an absolute plan to invade Australia. They wanted to harass Australia like they did with some raids at Darwin. They wanted to push past Australia as they did to Guadalcanal and sever the Australian West Coast US lifeline. But they realized even in the manner of Australia, that it was going to take dozens and dozens of army divisions and of course even more ships to keep everybody supplied uh, in order to capture Australia. So MacArthur's retreated from the Philippines, you know, Australia becomes the base. We go ahead and one of the things that Admiral King says is that this is in the spring of 42 before Midway and when things look pretty darn grim, um, King says, you know, we've got to take the offensive. We've got to blunt the Japanese attack, which ultimately ends up in the summer of 42 with the actions at Guadalcanal. So I think that there's a psychological issue of people on the West Coast. Uh, and of course, <laughs> rather, again, to use the word tragic, um, because of the fear that is on the West Coast, we know the order that comes down to basically send Japanese American citizens into internment camps, which is probably one of the darker uh, chapters of what America does in World War II. But to your point, Brian, I mean, there is hysteria that feeds those kind of actions. Uh, did the Japanese have the ability to affect an invasion of the West Coast, I'd say no, and I'd, I'd use Australia as the example as to why not. And we've got time for one more question from Kara. Hello again. Yes. Um, as, <laughs> as a Navy veteran myself, I've been studying you know, World War II quite extensively. I went to Normandy back in 2019, that was a trip. But I do have a question and I'm curious as to why, when we talk about Pearl Harbor and all the events, why the Arizona seems to be the most famous, most thing that's talked about. Well, I think that that's, that's a good question. Uh, I think the answer is out of 2,400 casualties, um, uh, uh, throughout Pearl Harbor that day, um, you know, there are uh, 1,077 men, uh, almost half of, of the total amount of casualties occur on this one ship. And um, at least from my research, I think today it continues to be the largest single U.S. military ship disaster we talk about the Indianapolis and some other things, but the number who are dead in one incident uh, is the highest. And then of course, the Arizona, just because of its massive destruction, it's not salvageable. Of, of the other eight battleships, even the Oklahoma gets refloated, it never sees action, but the other, other seven battleships all do, and the Arizona doesn't. And it really is all of those things, uh, the horrendous casualty loss, the fact that so many men are unrecovered and entombed there, it becomes a shrine. And I, I think that that focuses this tragedy of Pearl Harbor on the USS Arizona. Oh, thank you.